Okay, good afternoon. Uh, so uh, today's topic of drug-induced uh, liver injury is another kind of classic example of uh, what we try to accomplish by having this uh, series of, uh, of talks. Uh, it's an example that uh, bridges uh, pharmacology and chemistry in the beginning, and I guess you might call naturopathic medicine, and then it spills over into the use, the development of drugs, the use of drugs for a variety of laudable purposes. Uh, and then realization that was a, what was initially thought to be safe wasn't safe, at least not for everyone. And drug-induced acute liver injury is a major problem in the United States and for the most part of the world, except perhaps the uh, un truly underdeveloped world. So th this is something that has been accelerated by the commercialization of so-called natural foods, the sort of thing you buy in expensive bottles in the health stores, uh, ancient remedies that are claimed to cure everything that one can think of, but which have no known quantitative composition and vary one bottle from the next. At any rate, all of that, separately and collectively, has the capacity to produce serious uh, liver injury uh, and death. So you're going to hear today from uh, Leonard Seif. Uh, Leonard uh, graduated from medical school in South Africa, came to this country, trained in the Washington area, was here at the NIH and NIDDK for quite a few years. Uh, and is one of the leading figures in assessing the risk of drug-induced liver injury, how to predict who gets what, where, not so much how, but the occurrence of it, and what can be done. So his experience is vast, and he's a major player in a large national and international network where cases, some of which are quite rare with different drugs, uh, are collected uh, and material is put in a reservoir of tissue, blood, history, everything else, uh, for more reductionist, uh, translational, if you will, kind of, kind of studies. And our second speaker is Chris Austin. Uh, Chris graduated from Harvard Medical School who was trained in <clears throat> neurology, uh, worked at Merck for quite a few years on some really fascinating work on a, uh, studies of a genetic form of schizophrenia, came here to NIH in the Genome Institute and has escalated uh, up the stairway into more complex positions, and the most complex of which, which he will tell us about, is as director of the newest institute, uh, the National Center for uh, Translational Research, N NCAT. So, quiz time. Does anybody know who this person is? Just a moment. Anybody else know who this person is? Okay, who is it? Julie. That's Julie Axelrod. Now, what is this structure? Label That's Tylenol, acetaminophen. Now, why do we start out by showing you this? Because it's nice to have a little bit of historical background to where we are. Now, Julie Axelrod is a legend of the NIH. Uh, he was trained as a chemist. Uh, he didn't get a PhD until he'd written something like 50 or 60 major papers. He just didn't have time for that sort of stuff. The story is that uh, the NIH uh, could not make him a lab chief if you didn't have a PhD. So 
they arranged for one at Georgetown and submitted some of his papers. Uh, Julie uh, was a chemist, and he very early on worked on ways of studying the metabolism of drugs on the basis of chemical basis, uh, based largely on solubility, lipid soluble versus water soluble, and so forth and so on. And as a result of that, he really discovered pathways of drug metabolism. And I'm going to show you that in a moment. So he then became very uh, influential in the pharmacology community with the discovery that, for example, one drug can influence the metabolism of, of the others. But his real fame came when he applied that study of chemistry to the first detection of neurotransmitters. And that's what he won the Nobel Prize for in 1970. In his early work, at that time, aspirin, acetylsalicylic acid, was the drug that people gave to their children if they had high fever, and people took if you had some joint pains or cold, whatever it was. It was like the universal uh, panacea. Years later, of course, it turned out that aspirin actually had rather serious toxicity particularly when given to young children with very high fevers, and they would develop mitochondrial defects in their liver and in their brain, and some of them died. But nobody knew anything about the metabolism of aspirin or one of its derivatives, phenacetin. So Axelrod, very early on, gave phenacetin to himself. He was always walking around with a bucket of urine for that he was collecting because he was the subject for most of his studies. And so they took, <clears throat> they followed the metabolism of phenacetin and found this N-acetylated aminophenol in the urine. That's the major metabolite of phenacetin. N-acetyl paraaminophenol, which became later when it was commercialized, not by Julie, Pile and all, or in the United Kingdom, para acido mol. <clears throat> so Julie looked at the formula of this and said, Wow, this would be a better antipyretic than aspirin. And they put it on the shelf. And it sat on the shelf for many, many, many years. I think probably about 30 or 40 before aspirin uh, was shown to be toxic. By that time, there were no patent rights or anything. And the company, Roche, I think, I don't know, that makes Tylenol, commercialized on it, and it becomes one of the most highly used drugs. Now, why would we start out something on Dilly, drug-induced liver injury, by talking about Tylenol? And the reason is because Tylenol is one of the top 10 causes of liver injury. It first came to attention, when you take Tylenol, most of the time you're taking a half a gram tablet, capsule, whatever at a time. If you take 10 grams, within three days your liver will undergo massive necrosis and you either have a liver transplant or you die. Early on, if you happen to have evidence of Tylenol liver toxicity, that is, within the first few days, this can be treated rather successfully uh, by giving N-acetylcysteine. I'll explain why in a minute. So this is a major problem, and in Europe, it was the major cause of suicide amongst young people because paracetamol like Tylenol, you can buy over the counter. And it's pretty cheap. The risk of liver injury is enhanced if you drink alcohol. Probably not a glass of wine or an occasional cocktail. But uh, if you hang one on over the weekend while you're taking more than five grams of Tylenol, you're skirting with disaster. 
Other drugs also can accelerate it or pre-existing liver disease. It can require much, much less than 10 grams of alcohol to cause major liver injury. And it took a long time, close to 10 years, for the FDA and the various groups to finally come around and put labels on Tylenol, which warn against these things. And the product label, often in very small print, is still not fully appreciated by most of the general public. Now, Tylenol is one of the best examples of Dilly. It's predictable. I want to say one other thing in introduction to this session for those of you who are not particularly pharmacologists. And so to put this in the perspective of what, how do we handle drugs? What does the liver do? And this is the big picture. When you realize that everything we eat, whether we want to or not, everything that's added to foods, all kinds of stuff in our environment, which advertently or inadvertently we happen to come into contact, everything that goes into the intestinal tract or stuff that's made there of a toxic nature, for example, by the microflora that we heard about a couple of weeks ago, all that stuff circulates through the portal blood to the liver. The liver is the major barrier that protects us from killing ourselves with all that stuff in the outside world and in our food. So how does it do it? It does it by two major biochemical processes. One, an oxidative process located in the endoplasmic reticulum of the hepatocyte is catalyzed using molecular oxygen and a series of cytochromes called cytochrome P450. That's their absorption wavelength. They've been renamed SIPs. They're all the same thing. Mixed function oxidase, they were first called. So what they do is they take like a chicken wire structure, like a phenol ring, for example, and they open up one of the bonds, insert an oxygen, and then a hydroxyl group. So now you have hydroxylated whatever it is a drug, whatever it is, and that makes it more water-soluble. And that hydroxyl group conjugated in a second step of reactions in the liver, mainly, but not exclusively, with compounds like glucuronic acid, sulfate, some nitrogen, and so forth, all of which render this stuff highly soluble and substrates or transporters that secrete it from the liver cell into the bile, out of the body. And that's the major mechanism of protection against most drugs, toxins, and so forth. The second process is in the soluble, the cytoplasm of the hepatocyte, and that involves the, the tripeptide glutathione gamma glutamyl cystoglycine. And it's the cysteine which reacts with any negatively charged compound. Now, when you think of it, all the millions of structures of stuff that we could be exposed to, there isn't a simple, separate process for each one of those. These are garbage disposal systems that operate with huge capacity but limited specificity. As little as a negative charge on a molecule will render it conjugated with glutathione, and the glutathione adducts are also secreted into the bile by a specific transporter. So these adducts, the conjugates, the glutathione adducts, are secreted. And this is our major protective mechanism which most of which sits in the liver, and for much of which liver disease impairs. Now, the liver is also capable, these same responses, of mediating disaster. Because when you form, say, from a benzene ring, 
that hydroxyl tack on, the first step is just to put an oxygen. That's called an epoxy. You form that molecule, which is highly reactive, and it generates the production of reactive oxygen within the liver. Now, the more active the P450 is, the more of this stuff is formed. And most of this is protected by forming glutathione adducts. But if you don't eat a decent diet, if you're an alcoholic, if your liver is depressed in glutathione, or if you've been taking a lot of Tylenol, which as I'll show you, depletes the glutathione, then you are susceptible to this generated reactive oxygen species. And these guys form adducts with proteins which are critical for cell function, particularly in the mitochondrion. OK. Now, at this point, Leonard was going to talk, but he made an error, brought the wrong power stick, so he went home to get the right one. He lives only 10 minutes from here, and I'm sure we'll make an, an, an appearance very shortly. But meanwhile, we're going to change the order of things, and I introduce you to Chris Austin, who's going to talk about a different but related area. Yeah. Yeah, so um, the first thing is uh, saying anything with liver in the title with Win Arius in the room is really intimidating. <clears throat> so I, I hope you will uh, bear with me here. Um, I don't know if Win's ever told you what his background is, but he's, um, he's really Mr. Liver or Dr. Liver, Reverend Liver, Rabbi Liver. I'm not sure which, whatever you want to be. Um, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Thank you. Um, so. Yeah, so uh, the way we had originally intended this was that um, you were going to hear more about liver injury, and then I was going to tell you about new ways that uh, we're trying to deal with this problem. Um, so, so just keep what I'm going to tell you in your mind and then rewind when Leonard gets here. So uh, <clears throat> I just thought I would tell you what uh, NCATS is all about um, uh, and that before I dive into what we're doing in toxicity. Uh, the, uh, our... Um, uh, mission is is this. Um, it's all about catalysis. It's all about new methods and new technologies that will leapfrog. We hope over some of the uh, some of the roadblocks, hurdles uh, in the translational process that enhance uh, the uh, development, implementation of, of interventions, diagnostics, therapeutics, devices, etc., uh, that improve human health. Um, and and one of the roadblocks. Um, in, uh, in doing this is, uh, is um, you just heard from when, either uh, pre hoc or post hoc, uh, is toxicity, either liver tox, which is uh, still the most common cause of, of toxicity, but, or bone marrow tox, neurotox, et cetera. And if you combine preclinical toxicity and uh, uh, clinical toxicity that is seen in animals and, and compounds are killed, uh, or uh, only um, um, toxicities which are seen in animals, in, sorry, in humans, um, and then the compound is killed. It's about a third of the time uh, that drugs uh, fail. And, and there was a, was a related problem in the environmental world, um, that is that uh, there are about 80,000 chemicals that uh, we are exposed to uh, because of their in commerce. They're never intended uh, for human use. And actually, there's no uh, human data that's required uh, to have these, uh, these chemicals be used in, in human use because there's no there's no, uh, no intention for humans ever to be exposed to these. And there are things like uh, the flame retardants uh, in your clothing or the, uh, the lacquer that's in the chair that you're sitting on um, uh, or the, the styrofoam that's in your coffee perhaps in the morning. Um, and eventually, all of those substances make it into the groundwater uh, from a landfill, and then uh, people are exposed to them. And what's remarkable about this is that of the approximately 80,000 chemicals in commerce, only about 2,000 of them have any data whatsoever about uh, their biological effects uh, because you're never intended to eat the chair you're sitting on. So there's, there's no acceptable human dose of a chair. Um, uh, however, 
Um, it's, as we all know, um, uh, people get exposed adventitiously to all kinds of chemicals. And so uh, the EPA and the National Toxicology Program came to us a number of years ago and said, you know, we're just dying here because we can do about 200 animal studies a year at an average of three, uh, three million bucks a pop. And uh, even when we do those, uh, it's not terribly predictive of human toxicity. And the chemical industry is coming up with a thousand new chemicals, a thousand new potential Tylenols every year. And so we're following, we're falling farther and farther and farther behind. So isn't there a, a better way to do this? Um, and, uh, and so uh, this was really the challenge that we got uh, confronted with. And you just heard Wynn go through a beautiful example of, uh, of Tylenol, uh, figuring out the mechanism of Tylenol, which is really ultimately what this program is trying to do, but to do it in a general way, to understand what the general principles are uh, of chemicals that make them toxic uh, broadly. And, and, and so uh, if to, to understand this, you have to understand that the, 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 the conventional way that, that, that chemicals are, are tested and have been tested for, for decades and decades uh, is that, that animals are, are given a certain uh, exposure uh, to a, a given chemical, either IV or, or uh, uh, parenterally or uh, orally, and that gives you a certain tissue dose. And then uh, to be just a tad uh, a pejorative, you close your eyes and wait for something to happen, and that, and that results in a toxicity. In the tox world, this is called an apical endpoint for various bizarre reasons. But it, it basically means it's something observable. The animal dies, gets a tumor, uh, the liver fails, something obvious. And then you say, huh, that chemical was probably bad. Let's go on and test another one and see if, see if the same thing happens. And if it doesn't, we'll say, yay, this is great. We'll go on and develop that as a drug or you know, put it in a chair. Now, the problem with this is that we don't learn anything. And so every time we go through this, the same thing happens. And we don't understand what the general rules are by which chemicals cause toxicity. And so we're not getting any better, and drugs keep failing. So the idea was very simple. Wouldn't, shouldn't there be a way to understand uh, what the molecular targets are, the cellular changes, the network changes, the systems level changes that happen in response to chemicals generally that, that would allow us to predict, uh, first of all, understand toxicity and then ultimately pr to, to predict it. So, so if, you, if you think about this from a, a, a sort of um, uh, organismal standpoint, what you're doing very simply is instead of giving each one of these chemicals to an animal or a human and then watching for an endpoint, you're metaphorically dissecting the, the animal or the human into its component cell types and it's to its component pathways within the component cell types, treating each of those pathways within those cell types with all of those thousands of different chemicals, watching the effects that they have, either on targets, pathways, or, or, or phenotypes, and then computationally putting the rat back together again or the human back together again. So this is like the mother of all systems biology experiments. It's incredibly cool um, what we're doing. And, and this is a collaboration uh, among four agencies. And I mentioned uh, three of them uh, as us. Uh, the NTP is part of NIHS, EPA, and the FDA. Um, and these are the goals to identify, first of all, patterns of a compound-induced biological response. What do these compounds do to figure out what the targets and pathways are that they affect? Uh, and <clears throat> and, and uh, in, a, in a first instance, to prioritize compounds for more extensive tox evaluation, um, because the EPA has to do this. They have to make regulatory decisions. But, but ultimately, what we're really interested in is predictive models for biological response in humans. And so what, we've, what we're doing, we, these four agencies uh, came together in a very tight collaboration that started about five or six years ago uh, across all of these various levels, areas of expertise, everything from uh, a very high throughput screening, which we do at our place, through uh, various uh, more, um, uh, more, more uh, sophisticated uh, assays, cell-based assays and, and tissue assays, uh, to omics methods, uh, and, uh, uh, and informatics tools to put all this together. And just to say this, I don't want you to look at these names. I just want, this is the shock and awe slide to show how you say how many people are involved in this. And the, and the wonderful thing about this is this is actually four government agencies who are all working with each other. It's, it's almost unheard of, uh, but it actually works uh, extremely well because all of these are complementary to each other. So how does this work? Um, how it works is that, that the testing system, or otherwise assays, these are all cellular assays, uh, are, are nominated by somebody. We think this is relevant <clears throat> to toxicity for one reason or another. Uh, they get optimized within our place um, uh, up the SCGC, with the NIH Chemical Genomics Center up in Rockville uh, as part of NCATS, um, and then uh, screened, in this case, uh, across 10,000 different chemicals. 
uh, 10,000 different chemicals tested at 15 different concentrations. Because if you haven't heard the old adage about dose makes the poison and Paracelsus and all that stuff, this is this is uh, uh, you're talking about toxicity. It's all about dose, as Wynn was talking about. So you can't just test it at one concentration. Test it at 15 concentrations. But because these compounds are going to be used by the public and used for regulatory decisions potentially, we don't just do it one time. We test at 15 concentrations three times across 10,000 chemicals in a different pathway assay every week. So we're generating about 600,000 data points every single week, and all those data get put into a public database. We, we are uh, uh, obsessive compulsive uh, in the extreme about uh, all the optimization and validation that we do, all the screening, the data processing, et cetera. Uh, then it goes into a, a, an internal uh, uh, sort of holding area, sort of purgatory here, while uh, all the various uh, agencies uh, pour over the data to make sure it's reliable before it's released to the public. Uh, uh, this, this is just to remind me to tell you that, that one of the things that's really important um, in, uh, in chemical testing, which believe it or not has not traditionally been done, at least at the scale that we're talking about, is to actually make sure that the chemical you're, chemical you're testing is actually the chemical he, that you think it is. And this may sound trivial. Uh, is, is, those of you who are like a biologist, you've always got to make sure you resequence the clone when you clone it, make sure there's no errors, that PCR errors or anything else. So chemicals are the same way. Uh, but actually, the history of the pharmaceutical industry is that uh, about 10 years ago, pharma companies started looking into their massive compound collections of hundreds of thousands of compounds to figure out why they didn't find more actives. And it turned out that upwards of 50% in many cases of the compounds that they thought were in the collection actually weren't there. There was either nothing in the well, nothing in the, in the tube, or it was the wrong compound, or it was three compounds, or it was, it was, a, it was a breakdown product. So if we're, if we're having a project like this, where we're going to try to figure out the fundamental basis of why chemicals are toxic, we can't have this happen. So every one of these compounds goes through a very uh, stringent QC process, LCMS, GCMS, um, and, and, and we do this on a regular basis. Okay, so I mentioned this quantitative high-throughput screening business. Uh, for those of you who aren't into this, if, if you, if everybody else in the world pretty much who does screening does it at one concentration. This is really dumb, uh, and Wynn can tell you why it's dumb, because, and I always use Tylenol as an example. Actually, when I'm talking about this, I say, you know, you take 50 milligrams of Tylenol, probably not going to do much. You take 500 milligrams of Tylenol, might help your headache. You take 5,000 milligrams of Tylenol, especially with a few drinks, your liver liquefies. So in that case, same dose. Same, same drug, three different doses, you are a bioassay. And, it's, and, and your reaction depends on a dose. This is a bioassay too, it's no different, it's just a cell. But it's the same principle. So that's why when we set up the NCGC about 10 years ago, we did everything in dose response. Uh, and, um, and, and so all of these compounds are tested, at, in this case, 15 concentrations. And we have a big fancy robot that you can come up and see if you want to, it's kind of hypnotic. Uh, but, but that's what everybody loves to see. Uh, but, but really the hard part is this part, which is the informatics. It's just like the Genome Project and every other big, uh, uh, big data uh, 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 initiative. There's, uh, without going into it, there's a huge amount of, uh, again, OCD level uh, um, uh, 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 validation of these data uh, before the data are shared and then put into a number of public databases. So what have we done here? Um, keep in mind, I just want to remind you what the, what the numbers are in, in, in testing of uh, molecules in animals uh, in the environmental world, there's about 300 to 400 chemicals tested every year. Uh, and, and we only have data on about 2,000 to 3,000. In the pharma world, it's hard to know how many are actually tested because that's never, never disclosed, but it's probably no more than 500, maybe a little bit more than that. And, and in this case, in phase one, sorry, phase one, which ended uh, a, a number of years ago now, uh, we actually screened this plus this, about 2,800, 2,800 chemicals uh, across about uh, a total of about 300 different assays. Um, and, and the whole idea was to get an idea of what these compounds are actually doing. Uh, and and a, a lot of the proof of principle of, of what we were trying to do here is to make sure that the, that, that the data that we got were actually uh, reliable and interpretable, and that that uh, if we did the same experiment, you know, twice, different days, different plates, et cetera, we got the same result, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and and once we did that, uh, we we scaled this up to a phase two, 
which now has 10,000 different chemicals in it, including Tylenol and aspirin. Actually, every drug ever approved for human use is in this collection, uh, plus about uh, 3,000, that came from us, and then about 3,000 chemicals from EPA. They're mainly pesticides, food use chemicals, things in your, in your Lucky Charms, if you eat those, those, those lime green cereal, you know, whatever the heck that stuff is, that's, that's in this collection. Uh, and then uh, from the NTP, there's a lot of industrial chemicals, uh, dioxins, things like that. Um, okay, so uh, this is what the collection looks like. Again, it's, uh, it's about 3,000 from each, industrial chemicals, pesticides, food use chemicals, and drugs. Um, and uh, at this point, uh, uh, just in the last couple of years, we put about uh, 30, it's probably up about 40 million data points in, in PubChem now. So the idea is that, that this is the equivalent of uh, what the Genome Project did for genomics is what we're doing for chemical genomics. Um, and so what, we're, what is beginning to come out of the mist here now is, again, what, what are the general principles? What are uh, the, 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 um, uh, the, the reactive or toxic, uh, uh, toxical fours, if you want to call them that, that, that is characteristics of molecules that would make them toxic of one sort or another, not just hepatotox, but all the other kinds of toxins. Okay, so what were the limitations of, of phase two? Well, you know, I said we did about two, three hundred uh, 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 assays, but uh, there we actually did a, uh, we're working on this now, and uh, you'd probably be interested in this. Uh, I, I went to our uh, informatics people and I asked a very simple question. Uh, and those of you who run labs will know this is the kind of simple question that people like me like to ask, uh, which is I, I went to them and I said, look, uh, if if we're going to figure out what the, what the principles are by which compounds lead to toxicity, and if you assume that any pathway that is involved in physiology, when you disrupt it, might cause pathophysiology, otherwise known as toxicity, we first have to enumerate every pathway operant in mammalian cells, and then we have to identify how many assays which are, which are not pathway assays, they're really network assays when you think of them, how many assays would we have to do to cover all of biological pathway space? Go away. They come back in, I thought they might come back in two weeks. It took them like two years, but they figured this out, and I don't have time to show it to you, but now there's a, there's a, there's a three-dimensional globe, we call it the bioplanet, that has every pathway uh, uh, represented on it, and you can, actually, you can actually change the light. It's like kind of going to the Smithsonian, or going to the, you know, going to the, going to an, uh, 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 go into a, a planetarium, and you can light up various uh, pieces, parts of the sky. That's sort of what this looks like. Uh, and you can light up diabetes pathways or liver tox pathways or whatever pathway you want. Um, and, but, but at this point, uh, we have limited pathway coverage. We're using reporter gene lines as artificial lines. The set of chemical coverage is big, it's 10,000 chemicals. But remember, there's 80,000 in, chemi 80, uh, in, uh, uh, in commerce. We're focusing mainly on single compounds, as, and as Wynn was saying, uh, usually people don't just take Tylenol, they take Tylenol uh, and uh, alcohol and the Big Mac. And so that's like, probably, it's probably like 5,000 chemicals, toxic chemicals in a Big Mac alone. Uh, and so uh, then you have to talk about uh, uh, testing mixtures, because that's what people are exposed to. Um, this is a big deal. Uh, uh, Wynn just showed you that Tylenol by itself it's not terribly toxic. However, when it's metabolized, it is. And that's a frequent uh, 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 situation. And trying to do xenobiotic metabolism in a 1536 well plate in uh, uh, 500,000 reactions a week uh, is non-trivial. That's one of, the, one of the technology development things we're working on. Um, uh, so in, in phase three, we're focusing on all, all, all of those things. But in addition, uh, on, on uh, 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 like everybody else, ESL, IPS cell lines, uh, cell types, et cetera, et cetera, integration of metabolites. Uh, and we're also looking a little bit into this. You know, a lot of people have done work in, in uh, model organisms on tox. It's unclear to us how really useful this would be. But, um, and, and if you look at what we're looking at in, uh, in, in the high content screens, You'll recognize a lot of the things that actually Wynn was just talking about, mitochondrial damage, genotoxicity, oxidative stress, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this one, uh, uh, glutathione uh, depletion uh, right here, which is another assay. Um, and so uh, we're using a lot now of, of, of human cell lines for tox uh, assessment uh, in, the, in the hepatocyte worlds, because as we're talking about, there's a, uh, there not only are uh, uh, liver uh, hepatocytes that one can get from, uh, from donors, I always love that term, donors, because it's like they voluntarily gave you their liver. They're, they're usually dead donors. But anyway, they're donors. 
Um, uh, and, uh, but there are others, uh, 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 liver stem cells or HEPA-RG cells, which we're also using as well, which are true stem cells. Lines, we actually published a paper a couple of years ago of uh, assessment of compound hepatotoxicity using uh, cryopreserved hepatocytes, which are, which are uh, very broadly available from a number of different companies. Farmers use them every single day to, to, to look at, uh, at, um, uh, look at uh, uh, xenobiotic metabolism. But one of the things that we looked at um, is, is, the, uh, is the, the cytochrome activity uh, all of all of these, and now you know from when what a cytochrome is, uh, a SIP, um, uh, otherwise known as a P450, uh, across different donors. And you'll notice that each of these, these people is a different donor, and each of these is the SIP activity. And you'll notice that the SIP activity is, is, varies uh, among uh, donors, and it seems to be reasonably consistent. Uh, but it's important that it depends on who the donor is that you're using, and this is not surprising, right? I mean, this is the basis of pharmacogenomics, right? Uh, but also, uh, if you then go and you look at these, uh, some of these uh, uh, toxins, uh, and you ask, what is the, uh, what are the IC50 uh, for killing these cells uh, for cytotoxicity across all of these different donors, uh, and you compare it with a classic line HEPG2, you'll notice that HEPG2s, well, for, first of all, there's, there's a variation in variability across the donors, and some, some compounds show a lot more variability according to the donor than others, and in, in some cases, uh, the HEPG2s look like better models uh, uh, compared to the, the primary donors than, than, than others. And, and the, the reason I show you this is not for you to memorize all these numbers, but to, but to just realize that this is not, not just as simple as, as having the right cell type from the right species, but you've got to have the right genetic background, and they've got to be they got to be cultured in a certain way, in a consistent way, so you can actually get reliable data. Um, and, and I'll just show you an example of how we, one of the assays that we've done, there's something called phospholipidosis, which is a, 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 a classic uh, a toxic uh, toxicity observed not only in, uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, hepatocytes, but in lots of cell types. Uh, and just to show you that we can reproduce this uh, by both at a, a, at a light microscopic level and, a, and an electron microscopic level, um, uh, in response to a number of different environmental chemicals and drugs. Um, and, and then using these data, you could do what you, you really like to do, which is uh, have, if you have enough compounds, you could develop predictive algorithms. And this was a, a paper that we published a number of years ago, a prediction of phospholipidosis uh, potential of small molecules. And so now the chemists who are making these compounds you know, generally, they, they have no way to know. Should I, if I, if I have, if I can make compound A or compound B, which one should I make? And and these are the kind of data that's going to allow them, we hope, over time, to make compounds that that uh, that are that are going to be safer a priori. Okay, so so Tox Twenty One Toxicology in the Twenty First Century, which is what this whole program, this whole massively reductionist uh, 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 program is. Uh, uh, it suffers from uh, one problem, well, many problems, but among them are, are, are the impedance mismatch problem and the translation problem. That is, we, we can test tens of thousands of chemicals uh, in, in, uh, in you know, 15 concentrations in triplicate you know, quite easily, actually, uh, every, different week, every, every week. But the problem is, how do we actually test, how do we actually get from this to the small number of compounds that we can actually test uh, in humans or in, uh, in, in rats? And, and that means that you've got to have a, a, a lower throughput, uh, more physiological setting where you can test, say, 100 compounds at a time. And we're doing a lot of gene expression and using a lot of high-content screening assays uh, to do that. Um, and, and we're also developing, uh, uh, taking a, a different approach, which I'm going to tell you now, uh, which is uh, instead of a, a massively reductionist approach where we go down to targets and pathways and cellular phenotypes and then computationally put the rat back together again, and that process, as I sometimes say, suffers from the Humpty Dumpty problem. Uh, that is, it's, it is possible that we will not be able to put Humpty Dumpty back together again, that certain emergent properties will simply not be modelable in this kind of uh, uh, reductionist way, almost certainly uh, likely to be the case. So uh, an, a, another approach to this uh, is this one. That is, instead of, uh, in, in, instead of going uh, 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 reducing the complexity of the system uh, to a single cell level, even less than that, uh, what you do, and uh, what you do is you make uh, a little tiny organs. So you make a little tiny liver, or a little tiny intestine, or a little tiny kidney, a little tiny brain. Um, it's in Washington, so we have lots of people who have little tiny brains already, so they're easy to find. Um, and and you put these on microfluidic systems, which for some bizarre reason are called chips. And I always find this is weird because you notice this program is something called, called organs on chips. 
which has a, uh, at least to me, you know, you know, you go to a cocktail party, you have organs on chips, you know, it's, it's kind of bizarre. But anyway, uh, uh, it, 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 they're sometimes called tissue chips. But what they are is essentially a little homunculus in a, uh, in a microfluidic uh, platform. That's the idea. Could you take a multicellular aggregate uh, which represents each of the organs which are responsible for, for xenobiotic toxicity, metabolism toxicity, represent them in a microfluidic, a stable microfluidic platform, uh, and, and be able to infuse, say, artificial blood carrying a potential chemical, have it go to an artificial intestine and get absorbed or not, go to an artificial liver and uh, liver organoid and get uh, metabolized or not, go to an artificial or uh, uh, a kidney organoid and, 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 and have a observed toxicity or not. And could you be able to use, the, could you use that um, uh, uh, in a way that would test for uh, toxicity uh, much more quickly uh, and accurately, uh, we hope, uh, than, than testing in animals, which is uh, very long, very expensive, and quite inaccurate. OK, so that's the idea. Uh, this is a program that's classic NCATS program in a number of ways. Uh, that is, that it is a very technologically uh, out there. Uh, we tend to really shoot for the moon on almost everything we do, because the problems in the translational space are so enormous that we're always looking for logarithmic change. And this would fundamentally change the way, uh, just like Tox21 would, fundamentally change the way uh, toxicity testing is done. Um, secondly, it's a novel collaboration. Everything we do is a collaboration. This is a collaboration with DARPA. These are the people who brought you the GPS and the internet and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, and so NIH and, and DARPA each put in 70 million bucks here. And what's going on is that DARPA is focused on the engineering sides, and NIH, not surprisingly, is focused on the, uh, on the biology side. Uh, and so, so here's the idea. It's very clear and a little terrifying for somebody like me who spent a lot of their career uh, before I became whatever I am now, um, uh, when, I, when I used to be a scientist, uh, doing 2D cell cultures. And what's really a, a, a bit frightening to me is that everything we've looked at um, uh, shows you not only that 2D cell cultures don't translate into vivo systems, they don't translate into 3D systems either. Um, and, and so the question is how much of what we've been doing for all these years uh, is really going to be turned out to be relevant. We'll find out. Um, so so they're being addressed with this microphysiological systems program, these three organizations. And so the, the organs are really multicellular aggregates of tissues, uh, of, of cells. Uh, the platforms are what are called chips. And then we hope within five or maybe 10 years to have this microfluidic platform, as you can see here. And, and the idea here is that you wouldn't have to have all of them at once. You could, you, it's a build, being built as a modular system, sort of like Lego bricks, where you can mix and match these in any way you want. So, so there, there are 10 different organs which are being looked at here. Um, uh, for, for your purposes, uh, uh, gastrointestinal means liver as well as uh, intestine. Um, and, and they have to be modular. They have to be viable for at least a month. Uh, and they have to be uh, 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 accessible. Uh, the technologies have to be accessible. Um, if you're interested in this, because uh, I'm, I'm obviously flying through this very quickly, uh, there was a, uh, uh, an entire uh, issue of, um, of stem cell research and therapy, uh, which was devoted to a review on every one of the 19 programs that's going on developing uh, tissue organoids as part of this program. Um, and this is just two examples. This is a lung, oh, sorry, a lung chip and a, a blood-brain barrier chip. And, and I will tell you that when this program started, uh, being, uh, being a skeptic, I thought this was nuts. I got to tell you, I, I thought this whole idea was absolutely nuts, especially because the, the really piece de resistance, which I haven't told you, is that the, the endpoint is supposed to be acceptable to the FDA to replace an animal test within five years. Now, that, that I think is nuts, because right? I, don't, I don't think FDA has ever done anything in five years. But, 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 but and, and they're going to want a lot of proof of principle here. But, the, but, but why was I wrong that this was, that this was nuts? And, I, and it's a really interesting object lesson in the translational space. That is that I underestimated the convergence of technologies, that, that, uh, that this is a convergence of not only IPS, ESL technology, but of biosensor technology, microfluidic technology, and tissue printing technology, which are all converging at the same time. So that every one of these programs, which is they're all milestone-driven, uh, go-no-go decision programs, every one of them is ahead of their milestone. Uh, and they're, uh, we're training compounds, um, uh, uh, things like Tylenol and 3-methylcholanthrene uh, and other uh, compounds, both uh, uh, environmental chemicals and drugs, uh, are being sourced and given to these folks to, to, uh, as positive negative controls. And, and these are the kinds of the toxicities that we're interested in. Uh, and you heard about this. We're focusing on liver, hepatocyte injury, functional defects, metabolic changes, liver failure, et cetera. Um, so here's the idea. How do you actually do something like this? 
Well, you, you can't just take a bunch of cells and throw them in plastic, because I think all of you know that that, that doesn't work too well. But if you want to keep ha cells, multicellular aggregates, happy and functional for a month, and remember, that's what you've got to do. You've got to start out with a scaffold that, they, so that, they, that these cells are interested in growing on. Then you have to have a cell type. And they have to form a given structure. And what's been remarkable to us and remarkable to me as a developmental biologist is that, is that these cells seem to remember an awful lot about what they're supposed to do. They're actually very cooperative at informing the structures that they're supposed to, much more than I thought they would. Uh, and, and so this kind of spatial temporal patterning, sometimes you, 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 you engineer in uh, by the structure. And actually, I, have, I think I have in my pocket, I think I have a kidney in my pocket. Uh, this is my ID. No, here's a kidney. So. Um, uh, this is not a real kidney, as you might, might imagine. But but th th if you if I'll oh, pass this around, what you can see this is this is a uh, uh, this is uh, um, intended to be blood coming up this way, uh, and then there's urine uh, this way, and there's a little uh, there's a little uh, uh, blood uh, tubule interface there that you could take a look at, and that that's one of the programs that's being developed by this um, this this program, and, and in that case. Uh, there, there's a very clear, you'll see there, uh, a spatial patterning that we are forcing these endothelial cells and tubule cells into. In other cases, uh, we don't do that as much. Uh, in, in some cases, they need to be perfused. One of these programs actually is, is looking at a vasculature and liver at the same time uh, for reasons that Wynn just went through. Um, uh, focusing on, on, on bioreactors, so-called, that will keep these organoids together for a period of time. Sometimes, depending on what you're looking at, uh, these things have to be innervated, not only with blood vessels, but with nerves. Uh, sometimes it, you've got to have a host response because a lot of toxic effects are actually uh, um, uh, generated by, uh, by inflammation or, or immunity. Uh, and then you have to have a readout. What are you going to actually use as a, as a readout? Uh, and then you have to have uh, some sort of computational system to keep track of all of this stuff. Uh, so that's what this program is doing. Uh, here's one of the livers. Uh, this comes from Lance Taylor, who some of you probably know, who's um, uh, been around this world for a while, this, this uh, high, high content screening world for a while. Uh, and and uh, uh, without going into any details, because we just don't have time for it, uh, they have designed these uh, liver sinusoids and asini, uh, which have uh, all of the, the cell types that are supposed to be there, uh, and uh, these biochemical and metab metabolic readouts, uh, which come from these. Uh, and there's a paper here that I know you can't read, but you're going to have these, uh, these um, uh, slides. So if you want to read about this, this is, will give you, uh, uh, we'll give you the, the reference from that paper uh, a couple months ago. And, and these, the, the concept here is that you have all of these various cell types uh, which are uh, in relation to each other in, in, in roughly the same form as they are in an intact uh, liver and having an extracellular-like matrix that, they, that they're living on. And then you have these so-called sentinel cells, uh, which you engineer to be subpopulations of each of the cells you're interested in, uh, not only the hepatocytes, but the cell eight cells, and epithelial cells, kupfer cells, uh, to, to monitor uh, cell functions, death or what have you. Uh, and, and, and here's just an example of this, and I'll, and I'll I think this thing even has a, uh, oh, sorry, no, no, I can't get it to do it. Anyway, this is a, a movie just showing that it, it, the biosensors turn on and off. But the point I want to make here is that the, the kind of thing you can do these days is, is to look for, um, uh, if you go back, um, yeah, I took out the, took out the, no, you'll see it. Okay, so the question is, do, the, uh, does this biosensor uh, phenocopy what you see in an intact in vivo situation as monitored by all of these reactions, cytochrome C release, uh, reactive oxygen species, mitochondrial functions, steatosis, et cetera. Uh, and, and, you, and there are various biosensors which allow you to do this. This one particularly looking at cytochrome C release from mitochondria. And, and, and the, the, this is uh, initial compound testing, and, and obviously this, this, these uh, these, uh, uh, these results come from the folks who were funded to do this. So what this is the classic example where they're showing you the compounds that did work. What we're not seeing is all the compounds that probably didn't. But, but, but to show you that there are examples where you can look at compounds or drugs with various effects, and, and you see results which are either green, negative, when they should be negative, red, that is, positive, when they should be positive, uh, or, or yellow, which uh, w w in, in, in the case of, well, sort of equivocal in a human situation. So suggesting that, that these, are, these responses are, uh, at least to the degree that we've looked to so far, are actually, maybe actually predictive of, of the response that you, that you would see uh, in humans, and that's a good thing. Okay, so future plans. MPS means microphysiological systems. Congressmen can't say microphysiological systems, so that's why we say tissue chip. 
for them. But, uh, but you all should say microphysiological systems, or MPS. Um, uh, and so the plans now, and actually what's going on, is to take what's been done in the liver, that kidney that, that you, you will see uh, coming around to you, and, and the GI tract that is the small intestine uh, mainly, um, uh, and integrating these uh, uh, into one platform um, uh, with these folks uh, who are, um, uh, have the kidney and GI. Uh, and and the, 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 the interesting thing about this uh, result, uh, about this, um, uh, this kind of platform is immediately you can begin to think about, uh, about incorporating the kind of uh, variability in, in cytochrome P450s that I showed you uh, at the beginning. That is that uh, because what you're dealing with is a modular, uh, 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 just-in-time, uh, make cells from individual donors or IPS cells, don't even have to be dead people, they could be live people, even those of you sitting in this room, um, that we would be able to make a chip which is relevant uh, to each individual from the, from the uh, IPS cells that are taken from those individuals uh, and therefore be able to uh, have, uh, get a sense uh, early on not only of the generic toxicity but the population variability in that toxicity uh, uh, at, while you're developing uh, the drugs. Okay, so um, this is a big program like the other one. Uh, so these, again, are the shock and awe slides. Uh, a lot of people from DARPA, a lot of people from FDA, and a lot of people from, uh, from NIH. It's run by Dan Tagli, who's at our place, and Mark Sutherland, who's at NANDS, uh, and a bunch of people from uh, virtually all the institutes and centers. Um, if you're interested in any of this, um, um, there is some stuff on our website about this. Uh, but really the interesting, the most easy thing to do, because you're here uh, and you're on the same email server, is just to email these folks. So the TOX21, the lead is Anton Semyonov, and the tissue chip program is run by Don Tagli. So that's it. Wow. No, you're on the back. Okay. All right, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So while Leonard's is getting hooked in, I want to put in a little bit of information that I was actually going to put in after Dr. C uh, got finished. And uh, uh, now, this is uh, appropriate because this follows right after what Chris was uh, talking about. Uh, this is a system that we work with, with uh, primary hepatocytes. One of the big problems with hepatocyte cell lines is that they all are running out of gas, and they don't carry out the normal functions. They do for some, but not for all, and so you have to put hepatocyte in quote. But Primary hepatocytes don't have that sort of problem. I'll come back to that in a minute. So, for example, this is a non-dividing culture of rat. We've done this with mouse and some with human. So these cells are put in what's called a collagen sandwich, uh, which permits gradients to form and adhesion to form above and below. Now, the interesting thing is uh, that uh, these cells, none of them are dying. What you're looking at are two stains. The green one are tight junctions. And they delineate the apical domain of this epithelial cell called the bile canaliculus. And we can stain that with one of these ABC transporters, the kind that pump the drugs out. In this case, this is ABCB1. So the importance of this is, and it's schematized down below, is that systematically, over the course of five to six days, this culture system, which has become depolarized when you put it into the medium, polarizes to produce the network 
of the biocanaliculus, which is the smallest branch of the biliary tree. So we've studied uh, how that happens. You can quantify it. And to our surprise, it was very interesting that this is associated with uh, mitochond changes in mitochondrial uh, dynamics and function. So here are mitochondria that are stained with an outer membrane protein, TOM20. And you can see on your left, by elect the electron micrograph, and then up above the staining, all these mitochondria are very small. Uh, they're not dead. This is not mitophagy. They're just fragmented. They've undergone fission. But by day two, a dramatic change occurs. As this cell regains its polarization potential, the mitochondria fuse again. They become large, huge, connected. Mitochondria are very dynamic and are moving all the time. Fission and fusion, and we can show it in these. And you see up above these long mitochondria. And that continues way out to about day six. Now this, uh, oh, I forgot that I had this one. Let me see if I can get it to play. Oh my. Okay, never mind. This is a movie that shows the mitochondria undergoing fission and fusion. And, and this is sort of in a nutshell what happens. Uh, when fission occurs, you increase the number, but you also decrease the efficiency of the mitochondrion to carry out oxidative uh, phosphorylation and all. But fusion uh, leads to an increase in the mitochondrial mass. So you get these single mitochondria that are gigantic. And all of this is controlled by two sets of proteins. Uh, one, the fusion proteins, MFN1, 2, and OPA1, and also the fission proteins, uh, which are DRP1. And in this case of our system, if you look at the upper one on your right, uh, the fusion protein activity increases as these mitochondria are fusing. The fission one that controls fission basically isn't changing. So there's an activation of the mitochondrial fusion process, and in the bottom are a bunch of uh, structural proteins of the mitochondrion which don't change. Now, the fused mitochondrion functions more efficiently than that with fission. So in A, uh, that shows uh, the membrane potential generated across the mitochondrion over day one to six. Now the interesting thing is the ATP level, which is in B, is practically all disappears when you first isolate cells and put them in culture. And over six days or so, it restores itself to a normal level. But on day one and two, the ATP level is extremely low, but nevertheless, the cell preferentially uses that ATP to repolarize, to form this biocanaliculus. Polarization is an essential feature of epithelial cells. It happened back in the Mesozoic era. That's what causes tissues to be formed that separate the inside from the outside. And you have to have specialized structure and function to carry that out. Now, at the initial time, day one and two, when ATP is still very low, where does the ATP come from? And in C, you can see <clears throat> that the amount of ATP that's sensitive to oligomycin, which inhibits oxidative phosphorylation, it's almost entirely occurs in day one and two. So the damaged mitochondrion does something <clears throat> to enhance oxidative phosphorylation. And then, in D, deoxyglucose-sensitive ATP is glycolysis. So beginning in about day four, the cell switches over from oxidative phosphorylation to glycolysis. Now, what happens if we interfere with this process? Well, you'll see in A, what happens if we add oligomycin? or FCCP, that's the proton ionophore that blocks the mitochondrial membrane potential. The ATP level plummets. 
Now, the same thing happens if we add low concentrations of Tylenol and a variety of other drugs, which are widely used and are on the hit list for hepatic toxicity. Now, this process of decline in ATP is associated with the fact in B, the mitochondria no longer are fused. They quickly break down and form these inefficient small mitochondria. And C, the cell loses polarity. These things are directly linked. 2-deoxyglucose stimulates AMPK. So AMPK is the metabolic sensor that drives processes to make ATP within the cell. When we stimulate with 2-deoxyglucose, this process doesn't occur. So you're bypassing the initial effect. Now, where does the energy come from, from to run oxidative phosphorylation in a cell that has very low ATP? Well, here's one example. Uh, in A, those are lipid droplets. Those are lipids that form denatured and so forth when a cell is subjected to stress, either the isolation of cell or in the case of some drugs. And what happens during the five to six day period is those things disappear, and the fatty acids that are released are transferred into the mitochondria by beta oxidation. And that drives ATP levels, which are in B, and polarization, which is in D. Really dramatic. And if we put a drug in, a toxamere, that blocks beta oxidation, these processes don't occur. And the other source of energy is autophagy. When a cell is stressed and organelles and membranes begin to break down, the proteins that are in that are accumulated in something called autophagosomes. And they're like a reservoir of broken down proteins, amino acids, some nucleotides, and so forth. That's the source that is transferred to this damaged mitochondria that's preferentially used to provide the building blocks to make mitochondrial proteins and others. Now, one of the things to think about, and then we're going to hear from Leonard, who will set the stage in the clinical setting, is if you list, we've talked about Tylenol which is an example pretty much of a dose-related phenomena. Now, the problem that you're going to hear about, and the real challenge, is that most of the drugs that cause acute liver damage are not dose-related. They're called idiosyncratic. That means we don't know what the cause is, but it's not very common. And a big argument in the field, I think, is whether if I take the drug and my liver falls apart, is that because I have something missing in my genome or mutated, or maybe it's something else I ate, or whatever it happens to be? Is it one in a million? Or is it that all the drugs or that cause hepatic toxicity basically affect mitochondria, for example, in a way that I showed you the stress of cell isolation, or I just mentioned in passing, Tylenol. And the question is not uh, one in a million. It's that everybody, to some extent, is affected by these effects. That's how drugs act. And I develop liver damage because I've got something else on top of it. That's the tip of the iceberg. Now, this fits very directly into what Chris was talking about. How do you separate the generalists? Now, the last thing I would just mention, because now you're going to hear the real story from Leonard in a minute, is to think about. Of the 10 leading causes of drug-induced liver injury, the kind that doesn't happen to everybody when just by taking the drug, Nine of them are microbial-derived antibiotics. Most of our antibiotics came from bugs, penicillin, streptomycin, tetracyclines, all of them. 
They came from bacteria. Now, bacteria are the proposed origin of mitochondria. Maybe. There's a current, I mean, that's the thought. That's what you read in the review articles. And it seems that if mitochondria are major targets of drug-induced liver injury or the drugs themselves. So it's interesting to think whether these three conceptual things are related in a fundamental way that we don't understand. And maybe somebody, particularly a bright young graduate student or postdoc, will come up with a clue that will unlock this. OK, Leonard, we're all set, I think. Okay, let me begin first of all by, by apologizing. Um, I, I uh, was trying to download my slides uh, this morning actually. I was working on, the, um, uh, on updating the presentation and for some reason could it get, couldn't get it to come down. So I had to run back and had to go through uh, the traffic, which was, uh, which was pretty tough. Anyway, you've heard now two outstanding basic researchers talking about uh, uh, problems with, the, uh, with injury to the liver, and now we're going to have the mundane clinical aspects. But this is the problem that we as clinicians face when we, uh, when we find patients who have uh, abnormal enzymes, and, um, and how do we, in fact, identify uh, drug-induced liver injury. I'm going to mention two components. One is the conventional drugs. And very importantly, because this is one an area of great interest now, and uh, I am particularly interested about this, and that is uh, injury from herbals and dietary supplements. So Lynn, uh, when asked me, <laughs> Lynn, when asked me to start by uh, showing you a case uh, and uh, see how we go through the whole process of assessing uh, the possibility of drug-induced liver injury. So this is a as you can see, a 69-year-old Caucasian male was, uh, who was treated for skin abscesses with Augmentin, that is amoxicillin clavulinate, from 723 to 731 in 2012. He was hospitalized from 82 to 818 for new onset jaundice and pruritus. His past history included type 2 diabetes and coronary artery disease. Uh, on physical exam, he was icteric. His eyes were yellow, and he had scratch marks because of the pruritus. He, had, he was slightly tender in the right upper quadrant, and that was it. His other drugs included, as you can see, a list, glipizide, metformin, hydrochlorothiazide, and allopril, isosorbide, and simvastatin that he'd been taking for years and continued to take. Obviously, the, the augmentin had been discontinued. Uh, he'd had a, a set of uh, serum enzymes done um, earlier, before, that should really be 1712, uh, where his enzymes were normal. And when he came in, as you can see, he had quite a distinct elevation of his ALT. AST was at that point a little ele elevated. ALKFOS was also moder moderately elevated. And his bilirubin was up, 5.4. And this was very important. Over the course of the next uh, couple of uh, several weeks, 
Uh, his uh, amino transferase levels began to drop. His alpha-FOS levels went up a little bit, but they all came down. And by 914, he was back to normal. Billy Rubin was now normal. So the question was, was this drug-induced liver injury? So I'm not going to tell you what the answer is. I think you probably know what the answer is. I'll do that at the very end. But let me tell you how we go about dealing with this issue. First of all, some background. I think, as you heard, idiosyncratic drug-induced liver injury, that is drug injury which is not direct toxic toxicity. This is uh, uh, toxicity that occurs one in a thousand, one in ten thousand, one in a hundred thousand. Um, this is among the most common regulatory reasons for not approving drugs, as well as for removing drugs at, uh, from, the, uh, from use. At one point, it was thought that uh, liver injury was the leading cause. I think it's now cardiac toxicity, but this is at least very close behind. It may present, as you know, as hepatocellular injury, simulating viral hepatitis, cholestatic injury that looks like gallstone obstruction or a mixed pattern. In actual fact, there's almost no diagnostic form of liver disease, whether it be acute or chronic, that is not mimicked by, uh, by drug-induced liver injury. So what is about the frequency uh, in the United States? Well, first of all, it is rare. We're talking about idiosyncratic uh, drug injury. It's a rare phenomenon. But the true frequency in the United States is uncertain for several reasons. Often people who are taking care of patients don't even consider the possibility that uh, drug-induced liver injury uh, is the cause because they don't ask the right questions. They may try to do causality assessment, but they ma mismanage it. I'll show you how we, should go be, how we should be going through it. And then, more likely, a true case is not reported to the FDA. So we don't really know uh, what the real frequency is. And the view is that about 10% of uh, drug-induced liver injury from conventional drugs, and only about 1% of DILI from herbals and dietary supplements are actually reported to the Food and Drug Administration. I don't want you to, re to memorize this, but this is just to remind you that uh, uh, there have been a lot of regulatory uh, actions from the FDA because of Dilly over the years. Some drugs have, were never approved. Some were approved uh, elsewhere, and, and then they were withdrawn. And then there are a number of drugs in for which there have been warnings. And this is a sort of a list which seems to grow uh, as time goes by, although it seems to be growing less frequently now because I think the FDA is doing a very good job uh, of assessing the possibility of, impen uh, of, of DILI in the clinical trials and making sure that these drugs don't go into the market. So what's the prognosis? Well, it varies depending on the drug and uh, on its presentation. If the presentation is anecteric DILI, that is identified because the serum enzymes are elevated, but the bilirubin is normal, the prognosis is good, particularly if the drug is withdrawn. We do face a problem with this issue of adaptation because there are many drugs in which you treat the patient, they develop abnormality, and despite the fact that you go on treating with a drug, the values return to normal. This is true for INH, this is true for some of the statin drugs, and so this is a real issue when we are trying to consider the possibility of what should we do, should we stop the drug or not. On the other hand, if it's hepatocellular DILI that is associated with jaundice, this is a serious problem. Uh, and the mortality is said to be about 10%. And you see there in parentheses the word High's Law. I will show you a picture of High in a moment. High Zimmerman was, the, was really the leading expert in hepatotoxicity in this country. He was the father of hepatotoxicity. He wrote two brilliant uh, uh, textbooks. Uh, and as I will show you in a moment what High's Law is, uh, it's a, it becomes it's very amusing to me because all over the world people talk about High's Law and they haven't the faintest clue who High is. Uh, but he, he, is, uh, he was one of the founders of the, the, the whole area of hepatotoxicity. Um, if you develop, on the other hand, fulminant disease, that is enzymes up, bilirubin elevated, prothrombin uh, 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 abnormal, develop encephalopathy, the, the prognosis is very bad um, for idiosyncratic DILI at about 75% mortality. With acetaminophen, Tylenol, it's about 30% mortality. I think many of you may know of a study that's being done and has been in progress now for some years, supported by NIDDK, Will Lee, 
has been gathering all the cases of fulminant hepatitis in the country. And it is of note that something like 65 to 75 percent of the causes of fulminant hepatitis are drugs. And it's only a few cases of death from, from hepatitis and, uh, and other forms of liver disease. So, so if you develop fulminant early, uh, the prognosis is not great, although it's interesting that it is less with acetaminophen. So here's High. I actually came to work with High in 1964, and I was with him literally until the day he died. Uh, he was a magnificent uh, uh, hepatologist, but had a particular interest um, uh, in drug-induced liver injury. And what he found when he reviewed thousands of cases uh, all over the world, but particularly at the FDA, of drug-induced liver injury, that if the patient had a bilirubin that was elevated, greater than 2.5 milligrams per deciliter, or had clinical jaundice, and the ALT was elevated to greater than three times the upper limit of normal, there was about a, actually a 10 to 50 percent mortality. Um, so Dr. Temple uh, at the FDA, one of the senior people there, was so impressed with this that he called this High's Law. And now this has become known throughout the world as High's Law, and all the, the pharmaceutical companies when they're doing their clinical trials are terrified lest the case end up being called High's Law. Because if you have High's Law in the development of the drug, if you have one, there's a great deal of concern. If you have two, that drug will not come onto the market. So that's, one, so that's the big issue. So how do we diagnose hepatotoxicity? Unfortunately, at the present time, there is no specific biomarker for uh, drug-induced liver injury. So this suspicion of impending Delhi has to rely on identifying abnormal liver-related chemistries within about six to nine months of starting the drug, usually within six months, and then excluding all other causes for these abnormalities. So that is, in its totality, causality assessment, which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail. But how do you approach the issue of causality assessment? And there are two ways of doing it. One is what we call clinical judgment or expert opinion, and the second is causality assessment instruments. And I'll tell you about this uh, in a little more detail. As it happens, the FDA is having a big meeting uh, the next two days, starting tomorrow and the next day, where there's going to be a big debate about which approach uh, is the best for assessing co the potential causality of drug-induced liver injury. So let me start with clinical judgment. So what are the initial st steps when you consider the possible possibility uh, that there is DILI? Well, you have to recognize abnormal liver-related chemistries, that is al the ALT or the alkaline FOS. The ALT will, will lead you to con be concerned about hepatocellular injuries. alk FOS elevation um, is, uh, the concern is a, a, the, the cholestatic form of liver injury. And this may or may not be associated with uh, symptoms. And it has to, uh, and it usually will develop within six to nine months of starting the drug. Then, of course, you have to, as the, all clinicians should be doing, uh, do a systematic assembly of all historical, clinical, biochemical, serological, radiological, and if it's performed, a liver biopsy uh, in order to, to complete the assessment. So what about the serum enzymes as biomarkers for hepatotoxicity? Well, as you all know, these are nonspecific. Uh, uh, measures. It really is indicative of liver injury of any kind. The, as I mentioned, the, the increased ALT suggests hepatocellular injury. The increased alpha suggests cholestatic injury. But there is now an algorithm or an equation, which I will show you in a moment, which helps you to distinguish between cholestatic and hepatocellular jaundice. The, what we're struggling with now is what is the level of ALT increase of concern uh, when somebody is taking a drug, because often there are mild elevations of, uh, uh, of ALT, at what level do you begin to worry? Some say it has to be three times the upper limit of normal. Others say it should be five times the upper limit of normal for the ALT. And for the ALKFOS, it's two times the upper limit of normal. The problem that we are facing now is that we don't really know what the actual upper limit of normal value for the ALT is. There's a big argument going on about this. Um, as you know, the values for upper limit of normal are established by screening a large local population believed to be, quote, healthy, 
and then selecting as a reference number the mean value plus or minus the two standard deviations. So that's how laboratories uh, set their upper limit of normal. The population that they will screen may not, in fact, be healthy. Um, and there's a big argument. Often the reported upper limit of normal is, uh, is 40 units per liter. But there are now wide variations that are being found in the calculated upper limit of normal for ALT among all these laboratories, depending upon uh, the population being screened. It should note that in 2002, Dr. Prati from uh, Italy reported that the actual upper limit of normal for the ALT was 30 units per liter for men and 19 for women. So there was now a distinct difference by gender. And since then, there have been numerous papers in which people from this country, from Asia, uh, from, the, from Europe have looked at this issue, and most of them agree that the upper limit of normal is not the traditional 40 that we started, that we, le that we learned about when we first began. Um, and it appears that it, it differs not only by gender, but by age, by race, by BMI, uh, elevation of the, of the BMI, uh, if that is because they have fatty liver disease, and that accounts for the uh, abnormalities, glucose, cholesterol, triglycerides, and so on and so forth. However, at the moment, we're still stuck with not knowing for sure, so we take the compromise to use the manufacturer's upper limit of normal um, uh, when, when we are uh, assessing the possibility of uh, uh, this, trying to, uh, to um, determine whether a particular abnormality is elevated by two or three or four times. So what are the next steps? You've identified a signal. Now you have to define the category of liver injury. You have to exclude all alternative conditions that might be responsible for the observed liver injury. And then you have to characterize the signature of the drug-induced liver injury. The same people who developed something called RUCAM that I will tell you about in a moment came up with a, uh, an equation, which they called the R-value. Uh, in which you take the peak ALT divided by its upper limit of normal, all of which is then divided by the peak ALTFOS level divided by its upper limit of normal. And depending on what it comes out, you can then distinguish hepatocellular from cholestatic from mixed injury. Um, and this is used. Uh, this is used by the pharmaceutical companies. And one of the reasons for, um, for making this distinction is that other conditions that need to be excluded uh, will vary depending upon the, the, whether the injury is hepatocellular or cholestatic injury. So when we're working up a case, we have to exclude everything that you see here, hepatitis A, B, C, and E. And let me just focus a moment on E. Um, we never had any uh, thoughts of thinking about E uh, in the past with respect to drug-induced liver injury. There's now a number of papers showing that cases that were called drug-induced liver injury, when people went back and screened for hepatitis E, turned out to be hepatitis E. So hepatitis E now is much more common, as you probably all are aware, than, uh, than we had originally thought. So you have to screen and exclude the various forms of hepatitis, autoimmune hepatitis, EBV, CMV, ischemic hepatitis that can simulate drug-induced liver injury, fatty liver disease, sepsis, and the other thing that you see there, whereas in, if the patient has cholestatic injury, you meet, need to make sure that they don't have gallstone obstruction or some other malignant or, uh, obstruction or pancreatitis or sepsis. Once you put all that together, you now have to define the signature of this liver disease. And what, what are the components of, this, of the signature? And the reason for doing this is because then you can fit it into categories of known signatures of known drugs uh, that have led to liver injury. So you look at the interval between the start of the medication and the onset of the liver disease. That's called latency. You then, as we've just gone through, you determine whether it's cholestatic or hepatocellular or mixed. Then you see what happens if you stop the drug, which is called D-challenge. Does it go away? And if it doesn't go away, it may be that the patient always had underlying chronic liver disease that you didn't know about uh, and so that is not really drug-induced liver injury. It should go away. Sometimes it takes a little while to, before it goes away. Then there's this issue of re-challenge. Obviously, that would be the best way of identifying uh, whether a particular drug is, uh, is, is uh, responsible for the injury, but that's thing, that is something that we really should not be doing. Uh, re-challenge of patients with hepatocellular injury can often lead to uh, severe fatal disease, 
And sometimes what happens there is inadvertent re-exposure to a drug because people didn't realize that the drug had been used before, and they note then in the history that they'd been used before, and now you see a case uh, in which this particular drug has seemed to be responsible. Let me just mention the fact that, uh, as I said, the only biomarker at the moment are the serum enzymes, but there is a lot of work being done to try to identify other biomarkers, such as glutamate dehydrogenase, microRNAs. Um, and uh, there's some interesting uh, facts of uh, SNPs uh, in the HLA region, which is associated with DILI from a number of drugs, including amoxicillin clavulinate, which is the, the one that I showed you. A lot of GWAS studies are being done, and thus far have not turned out to be very helpful. But there's still a lot of work being done, and there, this is the big issue at the moment, and this is going to be discussed in detail at the FDA meeting in the next two days, looking for biomarkers for drug-induced liver injury. Now, what about causality assessment using the standardized instruments? In 1993, the Council for International Organizations of Medical Scientists, called CHIOMS, supported by Roussel Euclid Pharmaceutical Company, invited international experts to a meeting in Paris to work on refining causality assessment for hepatotoxicity. As you can see, there were people from various uh, countries, including two people from the US, Will Madry and Hai Zimmerman, and they came up with a weighted causality assessment scale that they called RUCAM, and that was Roussel Euclid causality assessment method. Now, what they found was that they awarded points for various, cat for various items, time to onset, the course, the risk factors, concomitant drugs, search for non-drug causes, previous information on hepatotoxicity of the drug, and response to re-administration. It seems pretty good. And you could come up with a score, and the score could range then from zero to greater than eight, uh, and you can see how then it was is classified. The problem is that um, although it's been used by experts uh, in the field uh, and by the pharmaceutical companies, nobody that I know of in clinical practice ever uses RUCAM. We actually, when I was here at the NIH involved with the Drug-Induced Liver Injury Network study, uh, we actually, we are in the Dillon study, the NIH Dillon study, assessing causality using both expert opinion and RUCAM and then we compared the two, and we found that the RUCAM was wanting. Nevertheless, the Europeans love it. The Americans don't particularly like it. So tomorrow, there are going to be two Europeans who are going to be telling us that the best way to assess causality for drug-induced liver injuries is to use RUCAM, and we're going to say, uh, two people from this country who are going to say that it's probably not the case. So this is the Dillon study that I think you should all know about. This is a study that's been ongoing now for 10 years. A uh, study supported by NIDDK. The F, uh, there are a number of investigators around who are collecting all cases of drug-induced liver injury, both from conventional drugs and from herbals and dietary supplements. So the most important part of this was that uh, they want to, to, they, to address the problem of the fact that cl cl uh, the clinical judgment is subjective. Uh, one of the aims was to develop standardized definitions, grading systems, and clinical instruments to identify and, ass and assign causality to cases of suspe suspected DILI. So there was, uh, there was a grading system that was created for the likelihood, uh, which ranged from unlikely to definite to with, uh, uh, their, you know, they're using legal terminology here, but we have much more precise definitions uh, specifying the differences within these categories. And at the same time, there was a grading system for liver disease severity. Was it mild? Was it moderate? Was it moderate severe? Was it severe or was it fatal? And there are various criteria that make up the definition. So just a brief uh, comment about the number of cases that have been collected thus far in the uh, NIH Dillon study. We now have a total, there is now a total of 1,300, 1,352. I think you should note that 83.3% were caused by conventional medications, and I will show you a, a list in a moment, but almost 17% were caused by herbals and dietary supplements. Now, you know, people believe that herbals are safe and herbals are good and so on and so forth. That, the, the, the data from the study we have here, and I will show you a little bit more than that, is un unequivocal. There are 
the, you know, these products are no, long, no more safe than conventional drugs. So here, and this actually is interesting because this is what Wynn was actually saying, I asked them for the top 15 conventional drugs that have been collected in the Dilly, uh, in the Dillon study causing liver injury. And as you can see, the vast majority of them turn out to be uh, antibiotics. Amoxicillin clavulinic acid way ahead, uh, way ahead. And this is true whether it was uh, these data were, whether data were collected in the US or they were collected in Italy or they were collected in France. Amoxicillin clavulinic acid is the most common uh, uh, drug causing a drug induced liver, excluding acetaminophen, excuse me. Acetaminophen is the number one, is, is, is one of the most common causes, but in these databases, it's um, augmented. I want to bring this to your attention if you don't know about it. And that is the brilliant work that Jay Hufnagel and his group have done in developing a literature review which is, which is in the National Library of Medicine called Liver Tox. This, what they have done is that they have pulled in hundreds and hundreds of drugs which they have summarized, put, giving every reference uh, that, that, uh, that relating to that particular drug, so that if anybody is interested in drug toxicity and you wonder whether the, where the data are to support it, this is the place to go to, uh, the libertoxnih.gov, and you will find everything that you want to know about virtually all drugs that are available at the present time. Now let me just quickly go on to herbals and dietary supplements. As you know, herbal products have been utilized for centuries in China and the Far East uh, as the predominant mode of treatment of various illnesses. However, there's been growing interest in their use in Western countries where they are taken largely to improve well-being, but as we have learned, and I'll show you some data on it, they're also used for uh, loss, uh, to lose or gain weight or for bodybuilding. The other problem is that many of, uh, of these are used to treat illnesses, and that's where the problem is, uh, because if indeed these replace conventional treatment, then you run into big troubles, and we're concerned about that. So what is the prevalence of HDS use in the United States? There were telephone surveys and reviews of a number of databases, NHANES, NIH, NHIS, FDA, and so on, that seems to indicate that somewhere between 30 and 70 percent of the U.S. population use alternative medicine, uh, although many inter interviewed individuals are reluctant to disclose their use because they think that they will face uh, doctors who, are, uh, who uh, disagree with it. Most surveys have found that the use of HDS products either taken to, are taken either with conventional medicine, which is then called complementary, or on their own, alternative, and hence the term complementary alternative medicine, and that this is increasing year by year. So an analysis for the amount of money being spent on CAM in 1997 estimated that conservatively out-of-pocket expenses for herbal products in 97 um, was something like $27 billion. Since then, NCAM at the NIH in 2007 estimated that the expenditure had risen to $33.9 billion, equivalent to about one-third of total out-of-pocket spending on prescription drugs, and that the cost for CAM practitioner visits was equivalent to about one-fourth of total out-of-pocket spending on, on physician visits. So you can see it is a growing uh, issue, the use of these products. And here there's a, new, uh, a uh, journal, the Nutrition Business Journal, that has been tracking the amount of money spent on drugs, uh, as you can see in the middle, and it gets higher and higher and higher, and the, uh, the increase or decrease year by year, and as you can see, with, two, with the exception of two years, the frequency of uh, the use of herbals and dietary supplements has been increasing every single year. Now, what kind of products are there? In the broader sense, there are two types of products. One are the so-called crude herbals, uh, which are single products, and these are the products that have been used traditionally for years by indigenous people uh, to treat um, uh, themselves for various diseases, uh, diseases and problems. All of this, as you know, come from the plant, it may come from the leaf, it may come from the stem, it may come from the root, it may come from the flower, uh, even from uh, trees. Uh, the trouble is that the chemical compositions vary by geographic location of the plant, uh, the climate uh, where it was grown, and the elevation where it was grown, and the time of harvest. 
Often we just don't know what the constituents are and the effect of those has never been established. More problematic from my perspective are the commercial products. <clears throat> these are made up uh, by, by companies that make these products. They contain numerous uh, uh, ingredients, not always identifiable. The contents and concentrations of chemical constituents may vary from batch to batch, the same product. And we have done that. We've gone to, um, uh, to purchase products and then uh, try to identify what was in it and to find that the concentrations completely differ. And sometimes they don't even contain what they say they contain. They also may be contaminated. And some are spiked with conventional uh, medicines. And I'll show you this in a second. And the other thing, of course, is the effective doses generally are not established, especially when it's sold over the internet. So how about contamination and adulteration? They are, where, where do these plants, uh, how do they deal with these plants? The plants may be cultivated and sprayed with pesticides or collected from the wild, after which they are harvested, dried, cleansed, sorted, and the constituents extracted by several methods. They are stored, packaged, and distributed, and at any step, they may be contaminated by microbials, mycotoxins, or heavy metals, such as lead, mercury, and arsenic. And there are a number of papers showing that this has, uh, has been reported. Now, what, has, what adulterants have been put in? What pharmacologic drugs have been put in without our knowing? Here's a list. There are probably more. But I can show you I've outlined sildenafil and corticosteroids. So when you think that you're taking a herbal, you may well be taking sildenafil or corticosteroids that's doing the, 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 uh, the, the, the work that they think it should be doing. So this is a real problem. And then, of course, the problem is if it's regulation. So that prior to 1994, the FDA did not permit food and dietary supplement manufacturers to label products with claims of disease prevention, mitigation, treatment, or cure. But in 1994, Congress wrote the Dietary Supplement and Education Act, known as the Deshea Act, that was signed into law on October 15th. This put the responsibility of ensuring safety of supplements and ingredients in the hands of the manufacturer who would not need to register their product with the FDA or get approval before producing or selling supplements, although they need to follow uh, CGMP. So it turns out that the FDA can intervene only if products are found unsafe once they're already on the market. Manufacturers are expected to notify the FDA if adverse events occur, but it is believed that fewer than 1% of HDS adverse events are actually reported. There are some new FDA draft guidelines for industry regarding notification of new dietary ingredients, and it turns out that other countries, such as EU, have somewhat different regulations. But this remains a real concern for those of us uh, who are interested in it, that these products that people are taking are simply not regulated. What about their toxicity? Well, we really have a problem because we don't know often what is in these products that is responsible, if they, particularly if they're taking these multi-ingredient pro products. First of all, when we go online to see what, what's in it, we sometimes cannot find what's in it, and sometimes they don't tell you what's in it. We're not sure if there's, if there's contamination that may account for it. And so it's a, it's a big problem of uh, assessing causality uh, for, uh, for herbals, and we're busy, the Dillon study is busy on working on trying to develop a causality instrument that would be more specific. What we would need is somebody who has a great uh, interest and capability of trying to identify the toxic components in some of these products, and um, we've been working with some of the FDA chemists, and we've got some interesting data, but we, we need much more. So what are the single botanical preparations that have been associated with hepatotoxicity? This is a list. Uh, some of you may know some of this. Um, uh, black cohosh has been used for menopausal symptoms, and there's been a big argument about whether it really causes injury, but it appears that it may. Uh, chaparral, greater celandine, germander. The one that everyone gets very excited about is green tea, because after all, green tea is probably the most frequently uh, uh, taken uh, liquid throughout the world. The, th the problem with this is that these, it's in hugely high concentrations, and the data are unequivocal. We've got good data, and uh, Herb Bonkowski and a number of people in the Dillon study are actually evaluating and trying to understand more about it, and we have some very interesting data on that. But this is a list of, um, uh, of the single... Uh, uh, 
products. Here are, I've just listed three uh, uh, commercial products, lipokinetics, hydroxycut, and Herbalife. Um, they have been implicated also in cause, causing drug-induced liver injury. I'm showing you this because this is a, not the only list, but this is what we have been facing. See, this, look at the names of these products that people have been taking and that we have, in fact, identified what looks like drug-induced liver injury. I mean, how about up your gas? Um, so this is, you know, it's, it becomes very complicated trying to understand what precisely is the cause, uh, the cause for this. And, you know, there's, there's, there, there's an effort undergoing to look at this in more detail. What I'm showing you here, and we're almost done with this, is we try to categorize these products. What were they used for? And it turns out that weight, the products that were used for weight loss and bodybuilding were the leading products that appear to be associated with, uh, with Delhi. And then you can see there's um, a lot of others for various, uh, that they are taken for various other conditions that are less likely to, that seem to be less frequent. Now, I can tell you, by the way, that what we have been seeing over the 10 years, that the proportion of cases due to herbals have been increasing also in our study year by year. We don't know whether this really means that there's an increasing frequency because we really don't have a, the... Uh, we don't have the, the baseline of how much of this is being used. But there's a study that's ongoing now focusing on one state, state of Delaware, where we're trying to gather all this information to see whether we can determine the, frequent, the, the actual rate. So this, here are the top 15 HDS products in Dillon, causing Dilly. And uh, these, I show it to you for what it's worth. Uh, we're trying to get this analyzed, you know, getting the an analysis done, particularly the bodybuilding, because the, you know, the question is, do they contain anabolic steroids that have been put in, or is there a, <coughs> some, is there a product that actually has anabolic steroid-like effects? And this is where we are at the present time. I also bring to your attention the concern about herb-drug interactions. Um, you may have trouble with anticoagulants, with cyclosporin, with a 3A4, prednisone, spironolactone. Uh, when, when people are using some of these products, so one has to take all of this into consideration. So let me conclude with the HDS. Herbal and dietary supplement use is extensive, rivaling and often exceeding the use of conventional medications. The products are utilized largely for weight loss and muscle building, at least in the data that we have but also to improve well-being as well as symptoms of chronic diseases, including those of liver origin. There is a general belief that because they are pure, <coughs> some having been used for centuries, they must be effective and safe. Their safety, however, is compromised by the fact, in my view, that they are not FDA approved, causing uncertainty about their reported and unreported content, some of which may cause liver disease. The effectiveness, unfortunately, of most of these products has not been scientifically proven, resting largely on personal testimonials and advertising. So let me come to the last slide, and this is the case that we started out with, uh, looking for all other causes of liver injury. And as you can see, he was screened for hepatitis A, for hepatitis C, for hepatitis B, for CMV, uh, all negative. The anti-nuclear antibodies, smooth muscle antibody, anti-mitochondrial antibodies were negative. We didn't do serum ceruloplasmin, but the patient recovered, so this was... And we did not do uh, ultrasound, because we do, as part of the evaluation, if there's a cholestatic picture, do ultrasounds or, or CT scans or MRIs in order to be sure there's no obvious evidence of obstruction. So this case was thought to be a classical case uh, of, uh, amoxic of uh, augmentin amoxicillin clavulinic acid. And I think I was trying to show you the difficulties we have in trying to identify and distinguish uh, the drug-induced liver injury from other forms of liver injury in the absence of, at this moment, a specific uh, and definitive uh, biomarker. But I think we're learning a lot more about it, and um, the, uh, Jay Hofnagel and the group are very excited and very happy uh, to be doing the study now. And, <clears throat> Hepatitis C used to be the big problem, but now it's going to be cured. 
and it'll become an infectious disease, and the hepatologists won't even see these patients anymore. Uh, now drug-induced liver injury is beginning to be an important component to look at. So let me stop at that point. Thank you. Were you able to predict with your assays uh, whether Tylenol, in fact, is hepatotoxic? Yeah, that's, that's I, I imagine, but with, with, without knowing it, you could, you could do this blind? Well, yes, indeed, that's right. But we're sort of... Oh, we're... On. Yeah, but the question was whether, whether we can detect... Um, Tylenol, the, the, the Tylenol, you're sort of cheating because everybody knows what the mechanism is. So, so we're able to test not only the the parent compound but the metabolites that we know are toxic. So, that the problem is that most of these we don't know what the metabolites are, and so, um, you know, a, a positive pro may or may not mean something, and a negative may or may not mean something depending on what the metabolism is like. So, so can I let me ask a quick question here. Uh, the driving force is to determine these things. It's not only to do it for large numbers and do it uh, quickly, efficiently, and specifically. It's also economically. It's uh, the fact that working with primary cell lines is labor intensive. To work with animals gets into all sorts of complicated business. Now, the question comes... How good, if, if those issues were not present with regard to animals, what would you actually do? Do you think that the value, is there, uh, is this really predictable? Is it just a matter of money and uh, society that uh, mice aren't used, or rats, or rabbits, or monkeys? Biologically, is it relevant? Well, my, my understanding is that um, when we come to idiosyncratic liver disease, animal studies are not helpful uh, because this is the interaction between the drug and the patient, as you say. I mean, if a, a million people take the drug and, uh, or a thousand people take the drug and only one person gets injury and 999 taking the same drug at the same dose doesn't, uh, there has to be some specific interaction between the patient uh, and the and the uh, product. Now, I don't dispute the possibility that everybody does get something, but you just don't see it because you're not looking for anything that that low. But this is not helpful. In I mean, I think that it's the direct hepatotoxin that animal studies are helpful for. But I mean, John Senior has always said he doesn't see any value other than in making sure that we're not talking about a direct hepatotoxin, for example, that should not be used. But from the point of view of idiosyncratic liver disease, uh, uh, the animal studies uh, don't seem to be terribly helpful. I mean, is that, that do you agree? Or? Yeah, yeah, and I would just say, when, yeah, when, when people have done this, and there's some nice pa published papers about this, that where in retrospect, if you look at, at, at drugs which are uh, either safe or unsafe in humans, and then look at what the results are in animals. It, it varies around 50 percent whether whether the animal model is predictive or not. But it depends on the particular kind of toxicity. Bone marrow is a little bit more predictive, and uh, but there are some others which are less. Like the neuropsychiatric ones, not surprisingly, are very hard to see in animals. But it's about 50-50. I enjoy very much both of your talks, and I have a question for Leonard regarding the drug-induced uh, liver injury. So reading uh, some of the papers, uh, drugs, especially in the United States, are the most important cause of uh, acute liver failure compared to other countries like in Europe, 
in the rest of the world. And I was reading that, especially acetaminophen, is one of the major causes because it's always taken for suicidal purposes. Here in the States, at least related to acute liver failure, as well as in England. So I, was, I wonder if uh, there is also the dose that is very important, apart amoxicillin and all the other drugs that, of course, happen randomly. But if, uh, I mean, reading the paper, especially from Wi William Lee, it's always taken for suicidal purposes, acetaminophen, both in the States and in England, while in all the rest of the world, still hepatitis B virus remains one of the most important causes of acute liver failure. So I don't know if uh, this may account for the different epidemiology. Um, uh, Patricia, certainly in England, we know that, that this was the most common way to commit suicide. And they try to deal that, deal with that, as you know, in various ways by, first of all, removing it from over the counter and putting it behind the counter, or putting it in the bubble wrap, because you had to, you know, you had to get out 50 tablets to kill yourself, and somebody who wants to commit suicide may not want to spend all the time doing that. So that's what they were doing. In this country, it's my understanding that it's less likely used for suicidal purposes. It's, it does. It's, it is used, but... Alcohol, for example, I mean, we, we were one of the first people to, I, to identify when I was here with, uh, at the VA with high, and we had uh, patients who were taking what would look like conventional doses uh, of uh, Tylenol who had been taking it because they'd had teeth surgery or they'd had a, a root canal or something, and they were heavy alcoholics. And we now have a lot of information about the, fact, the, the role of the alcohol in, in inducing the, the toxic metabolite in the person who was protein de, uh, depleted. So I think it's some of the uh, cases that they are, they're seeing here are, are not suicidal. And there was a difference. Yeah. Right, right. I think the other thing that, that I think has been seen in this country too is that, that there, um, <clears throat> which some of the, sometimes the most tragic is that, that a lot of the, the cases, they, they're not, they're, they're, um, uh, they're they're acting out suicides that they're or, or they're not intended suicides. They turn out to be accidental suicides, and that that you're because as we all know, a lot of this is 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 done for um, is, is a is a signal for help, and so they figure well you know Tylenol is supposed to be relatively safe, so I'll take you know instead of twenty pills of Valium, I'll take twenty pills of Tylenol. That'll and then it turns out that and, and as as Wynn didn't mention this, but but dying of, if you're going to come, if you want to, if you want to commit suicide, this is not the way to do it, folks. This, it is a really bad way to die. So it's, and and so frequently it's it's not an intentional, uh, it's an intentional suicide attempt, but it's not meant to be. It, it, You know, one of the problems, Patricia, is that Tylenol is in many drugs. Yeah. It's in many, many drugs that people don't even realize this. Uh, for example, NyQuil. Uh, NyQuil contains Tylenol and it's got alcohol. So, uh, you know, so people may not realize how much they are taking. So part of it is an inadvertent overdose. So, okay. Thank you very, very much, both of you. We've... It's very exciting. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> you didn't screw up at all.